Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. Gene Trowbridge and Jonathan Nay, founding partners of the top syndication firm, Trowbridge Law Group, LLP, have a legal team with over 50 years of combined experience in real estate syndication and the practice of real estate securities law. Over this time, Gene and his partners in several past firms and currently have helped clients raise close to $5 billion in offerings by empowering entrepreneurs to raise capital legally. To learn more about Trowbridge Law Group, LLP, visit their website at trowbridgelawgroup.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Chris Larson. Thanks for being on the show, Chris. Whitney, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, honored to have you on the show. Looking forward to getting to know you a little better. And uh, Chris is the founder and managing partner of Next Level Income. Chris has been investing in and managing real estate for over 20 years. While still a college student, he bought his first rental property at age 21. From there, Chris expanded into development, private lending, buying distressed debt, as well as commercial offices and ultimately syndicating multifamily properties. He began syndicating deals in 2016 and raised more than $15 million and been actively involved in over $150 million of real estate acquisitions. Chris, Chris is passionate, passionate about helping investors become financially independent. So we are welcome to the show, Chris. Uh, grateful again to have you. Give us a little more about who you are, your business, what you all are focused on, uh, and let's dive into your, your superpower. Yeah, thanks, Whitney. You know, that was a great intro. And, um, you know, I think it really, it really aligns well with what you and LifeBridge Capital does as well. And, you know, really what, what I'm focused on now is helping to give education and access to investors to the multifamily space, help them achieve financial independence. Because I really believe that if you have true independence, you can focus on what, you know, you're most passionate about in your life. Nice, nice. So, um, you know, tell me a little more about how you're helping, you know, uh, people become financially independent through Next Level Income. Yeah, we started Next Level Income about two years ago with the podcast. And, you know, we were, like, like you mentioned in the intro, we've been syndicating deals. Really, we started about five years ago, kind of started the process. We officially closed our first deal in 2016. But along the way, we'd have people reach out to us that said, hey, I'd love to do what you do or get to the point where you are or just get to the point where I can invest in one of your deals. But I'm not there yet. And what would you recommend? So I was, I was writing emails on a weekly basis, sometimes a daily basis, Whitney. And um, my partner, uh, Caleb Wellborn, who, who started the, the show with me, said, hey, we should start a podcast. And I thought about it. I thought, you know what? That's a great idea. It can help us curate information so that we can get the word out to more people and ultimately help more people. So really the, the first mission of what we do at Next Level Income is education. So we have a terrific blog, podcast, um, wrote a book that came out. And if anybody, um, you know, if you're listening and anything resonates or you want to learn a little bit more about my background, you can uh, check out the book at nextlevelincome.book. I'm sorry, .com. <laughs> Click on the book link and um, I'll send you one for free. And then the second piece of what we do is we actually provide opportunities for financial independence. Um, that's through uh, whether it's introductions to professionals like tax strategists or opportunities to invest in deals. Um, you know, very much like what, what you guys do. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know your, uh, your superpower and what we discussed was just your, your ability to, to look into the future, see trends and, and, and what's going to happen. And, and so I, I feel like obviously with everything going on right now, it's what everybody's wondering, right? What, what, what's the next three months hold, six months hold, year? You know, what does that look like? And you being an operator and very experienced, you know, just looking forward to how you do that what you see coming, obviously, um, and, and, you know, how, how you're taking that data and, and what you're doing with it. Um, and so would you just get us started a little bit on just your, your maybe your thought process behind, uh, you know, gathering that data and just trends that you, that you see happening? Yeah, Whitney. So like we talked about, um, I went to school right down the road from you at Virginia Tech. I was an engineering student, uh, ended up, I, I got my PE, I got my professional engineer, um, 
or I, I passed the professional engineering test. I never actually became an engineer. I went into the medical device space. And the reason I went into the medical device space is because when I looked at the demographic trends, this is going back about 20 years, I knew that the baby boomers were going to need more surgery and you could predict that. So I, I read a book uh, by Harry S. Dent and it, he talked about demographics. I started to read into that and some people think Harry's a little crazy. I think he's very entertaining, um, but his demographic data, in my opinion, is sound. And you can follow like long-term trends. So I don't, I don't follow like short-term trends when it comes to the stock market. I like to follow big long-term like tidal shifts, as I like to call them. So based upon those trends, I went into the medical device industry. I ultimately moved to North Carolina from the, the uh, Washington, D.C. area with my wife because we felt that the Southeast was going to be one of these growing areas. And as I talk about in my book, when I was looking at um, entering the multifamily space, what I found was the, the same demographic trends that I was following, not just the baby boomers, but also the millennial generation was really going to support this renter generation really from about 2010 to not just 2030, but even into like 20, the 2040s um, for quite a long period of time. So, you know, assimilating that information, I, I don't really think it's a superpower. It's like you're looking into a crystal ball, but it's really like a magic eight ball where the, where the information just bubbles up. Um, but we got into that space. Uh, you know, I started investing in the space nearly eight years ago um, in 2013. And yeah, I'm always looking, you know, looking at data. I read constantly every morning, every evening um, throughout the day. And I kind of follow Warren Buffett's rule. I think he says he reads something like six hours a day. And I really think if you look at the information, you follow the trends, it allows you to formulate a picture of the future. And like I said, you can, you can bet on the tides. You might not be able to bet on the size of the waves every day, but you can bet on those tidal shifts. And that's, uh, that's what I did to move into the multifamily space. Nice. You know, yeah, yeah. Reading six hours a day. Uh, you know, I, I thought I, I never enjoyed reading growing up and that, that was such a mistake. I don't you do know? that. <laughs> it's such a mistake. And, and now it's like, I can't get enough. Right. You know, it's like, how many, how much time yeah. do I have every day, you know, to spend reading and, and just educating and, and, you know, just gaining knowledge. But, uh, what, what, do you read six hours a day? No, not quite. I, uh, I, I read every morning, um, probably like 30 minutes to an hour. Um, if I'm traveling, I listen to podcasts um, and you know, I try to read every night for about 30 minutes. So it's probably about two hours a day of, of reading yeah. slash, you know, um, right. you know podcast, yeah. audio, yeah. audio books, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And how, where are you finding like things that you're focusing on your reading time on so you can understand better, you know, what's happening, you know, just in the future and how you're seeing these things? Yeah. So I read not just, um, you know, insights when it comes to, you know, the industry. So, you know, typical industry websites. And if you look at my LinkedIn profile, my Facebook, I'm, I'm always posting any sort of article that I find is informative or is really going to dive into that. I just try to share that with everybody um, on a regular basis. But then I'm also reading, like I just read a book um, called Lifespan by David Sinclair. And it's interesting because it talks about how Aging is a disease, not necessarily, you know, something that is inevitable, something that we may, may be able to prevent. And when you think about that and you realize that life may extend nonlinearly, you know, we've been kind of incrementally increasing our lifespan, like what is that going to do to the future? So that's something, you know, I read, you know, books and, and stuff on those topics. I follow um, different weekly blogs um, to follow kind of the bigger trends and then you know, the industry data, um, you know, for instance, what's going on in local markets. Like I was reading this morning, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, um, you know, is one of the, you know, one of the fastest growing, you know, markets with, with some certain things. So it's like, okay, you read that, that's important to the decisions we make today. Um, but the bigger picture items, you know, those are things that are going to be important five, 10, 20 years from now. Nice. And what, Gary, can you give us a couple examples of that? Uh, yeah, well, like I was saying, um, like lifespan. So, you know, I think if you look um, and you follow that trend and say, well, how, how are people's lives going to change? And I talk about this with investors and I say, well, if you, if you in, instead of shifted from the idea of retirement to the idea of financial independence and following what you want to do. So the, the people that I coach and mentor, you know, I ask them the first thing we do, I said, I want, I want to see your life vision. And then you know, I ask them, how long do you think you're going to live? And then, well, if you lived another 20 years or 50 years, um, you know, how would that affect what you did? And it's really profound. I think if you, if you said, Hey, I'm going to live to 80 and somebody came to you and said, Hey, Whitney, you're actually going to live to 160. You would probably change some things that you're doing with your life. 
you might For you sure. might take advantage of some things now. You might you might change and do some things bigger. Um, so personally, that's affected me. Um, you know, instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna retire at 40 and just have this pot of money that I'm gonna live off of, it's it's changed. I want to I want to affect and do more things um, for me personally. And then um, when it comes to you know markets, so if we kind of dive into the the today, the here and now. Um, we invest in the Southeast. We focus on markets that are, that are outperforming um, the, the country. And I know you, you have a very good understanding of this and you know, your listeners understand exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but you know, following the demographic trends coming out of the pandemic, you know, how are we going to see the trends? People moving from New York City. Um, we're seeing it here locally in Asheville. Properties are, are just flying off the market. Um, is it going to affect Raleigh? Is it going to affect Charlotte? Is it going to affect Atlanta? Um, you know, markets in Texas, Jacksonville, Florida, what markets are going to have outsized benefits and what markets are going to hurt? Um, are you looking at properties that um, are going to cater more towards lower income or properties that are a little bit higher up the food chain that have a higher median income? I think that, you know, the ones with lower income maybe hurt a little bit more in the near term. Um, so that may affect, you know, our purchasing and our acquisitions over the next, you know, six to 18 months. Can we dig into that right there just a little bit? You know, just like you talked about markets that are, that are going to benefit from this or markets that are going to be hurt. Uh, you know, I know the listeners think, okay, you know, how do I know that? You know, how's yeah. he figuring that out? Um, you know, what are, what are you looking at there specifically? What, what's giving you that information? What's important for us to know? Yeah. So, um, you know, whether, and, and again, you can, you can check out like on my LinkedIn profile, I share articles on a, on a daily basis. It's uh um, you just look up, look me up, Chris Larson, L-A-R-S-E-N on LinkedIn. Um, you can check out some of these recent articles, but we can see the trend of people moving from urban, high density, high areas of living like San Francisco, LA, New York. And I think that local politics play a part of this as well. So if you look at some of these areas um, where they're talking about uh, potentially defunding police, and I don't want to get political, but but, you know, if you're a high income earner and you're living in a city and you're in close proximity to people, it costs a lot, your taxes are high, and then you feel like safety may go down. You know, I, as a, as a parent, you know, I'm going to look at those things and say, Hey, is this, is this something I'm comfortable with? And the data seems to suggest that those individuals are looking to move more towards the suburbs. So that's number one, we're seeing an exodus from urban environments to suburban environments. Um, and we've seen this for the past 10 years. Number two, we're seeing an exodus from high tax states, um, typically in the Northeast, um, the West. Um, I mean, like California, like uh, the West Coast, to areas like Denver, Colorado, like Texas, if you're in the West Coast, maybe Oregon. Um, also from the Northeast, you're seeing an exodus from the Northeast to the Southeast and also Texas. I like to verify these trends by looking at the Van Lines annual report, and that just follows where people are moving. So you have a net in and out migration of cities and states, and you can track that on a regular basis. So that's that's something you can do, um, you know, from a kind of a mid a mid level. So we're talking about big trends, you know, those those big trends. We're talking about you know state to state trends and city to city trends. And then if you look at specific properties, you say, okay, what are people preferring now if they're going to be working more remotely or they want to have a little more space? So people are doing things like my wife's an architect, people are remodeling their homes, they're adding home offices, they're adding like outdoor kitchens, more outdoor space. Um, and in my opinion, I think the pa this pandemic, it's going to subside, um, but it's going to change people's psyche. And they're going to look for these things. So if we're buying a property, maybe we want to be in an area, you know, like Charlotte or Raleigh, um, that's going to be, you know, have more of a suburban setting. And then maybe instead of a high rise, we want to look at something that is a garden style two to four stories that has a lot of outdoor area. And then we want to make sure that we have amenities like high speed internet. So, you know, if you're a professional Whitney and you want to be working from home, you're going to place a higher value on that. Um, so kind of going again from high level to property level, and then even amenity level, you know, when you talk about how do you provide value and ultimately generate income in a property, something that a couple of years ago might've not been as valuable you know, high speed internet, home office, maybe an outdoor space is now going to command a premium. And that's going to help us make the decisions on the properties that we help, uh, we look to target. 
No doubt. No, I appreciate that. That's some great information. But, you know, how has that changed your outlook on the markets you are, Mm -hmm. I mean, personally looking at, say, you know, eight months ago, maybe you had, you know, these three markets in mind, you're really focused on, but now has that changed to something else? Yeah, our our large, like our macro view of the markets hasn't changed significantly, Whitney. Um, I've been focused on the Southeast, and I would include the Carolinas, um, Atlanta, or Georgia, um, Florida, and Texas, and, and all of that. I think there's other, like Phoenix, um, Denver, there's some other great markets. I know you operate in Colorado, which I'm a huge fan of that state. My wife went to school there and um, spent a lot of time out there. But that has not changed. What has changed is we are looking at a little bit lighter value add properties. So what I mean by that is let's say you buy a property that was built in 1975, 1980, that may take say $10,000 worth of work. And it might take a couple years to really execute on that value add strategy. And you may have a lower income um, or lower average income resident in that property that may be disproportionately um, affected by some of the stuff that has happened here uh, during the, the COVID crisis versus a property that maybe it's built in uh, the early 2000s on the last acquisition we made. It came online in 2014 and it had a higher median income. So almost $90,000 median income in the local area. So that property, in our opinion, is going to be more stable than a property that has, say, a $45,000 median income. Also, it doesn't require as much work in terms of you know, how much, how much money we're putting into that property on an immediate basis. It's a stable property already that we can do things like add the high speed internet and add operational efficiencies. Now, what I think is, you know, the converse to that is that you may have a little bit less immediate upside in a property like that. So you're trading some of that upside for the immediate security. But I think if you jump into a value add property with a, you know, a low, uh, Average income resident base, I think there's a little more immediate term risk there. So I still think that those properties are going to perform over the medium or long term. Um, but you know, you have to account for the risk that you're taking on and the uncertainty with everything that's happening right now with the economy. It still has yet to shake out. Are, are, is your group and, and you ready to buy right now, or is it uh, something you're like, well, wait, you know, we're going to wait? I, I hear, I mean, it's all over the board. Some some groups are like, mm-hmm. nope you know, we're, it'd be just crazy for us to buy anything right now. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And then other groups are like, no, we're ready to buy. You know, we're, we're all in. I uh, just weren't, where do you, you know, you all sit on that? Yeah, it's probably moderated a little bit. I'm kind of in the middle of that, Whitney. But what I would say is that, and I've said this to all of our investors, they call and they're concerned. And I think, I think sure. 2020 is not going to be a great year for multifamily. I mean, it's, I think, you know, it's, it's going to have a hit on, you know, the ability to move income. Um, there's challenges, there's additional costs. Like, of course, that's going to have an effect. So in my opinion, this isn't going to be the best year that we've seen in the past decade for multifamily. That being said, if you look at the fundamentals, I don't think the fundamentals have changed. And what I mean by that, and I talk about this in my book, we need almost 4 million units this decade to keep up with demand. 4 million units. I just read an article this morning and it was talking about how single family housing demand is outstripping supply because people, they're trying to move into single family homes or trying to buy single family homes, but millennials, they're still saddled with student debt. They're getting hit by, you know, the unemployment that's occurring right now, the increase in unemployment. So they're going to have to rent longer. What does that mean? It might not be good for Q3 revenue for a property, but it's going to be good for 2021 demand, 2022 demand that's going to come out. And if you cater to the right demographics, you can, you know, you can add value to, to those residents that you're catering to. Um, so the ultimate question is, are we buying right now? The answer is yes. If we find a deal that makes sense, that meets our criteria, um, we certainly will pull the trigger. We've made a lot of offers over the last three months since all this started. We haven't had one that we've been able to see eye to eye on yet but we're very, uh, we're very close on a couple. So we're confident that um, we'll have something here very shortly. Has anything changed in your underwriting, you know, that, you know, for, since say, you know, eight months ago to now? Absolutely. So first off, um, the income increases, the net rent increases that we've, we predicted, you know, you might say, Hey, we're going to get, um, you know, 4% this year. Like when we're underwriting, we're assuming typically flat 
income increase um, or rent increase um, for the immediate future for the first year, for instance. So that's a big, that's a significant difference. Um, cost, you know, if you look at some of the incremental costs associated with COVID-19, um, you know, that's, that's something that we underwrite into that. Um, some of the amenities, you know, you're not, you know, if you look at say, oh, we're going to add a gym this year, that's going to add value. That's probably not going to add a lot of value uh, this year. Um, so you're looking at underwriting, you know, different amenities. So like I said, we may be adding high speed internet versus doing an upfit on a gym, or we may be adding an outdoor space um, versus doing a gym, for instance. Um, that's not, you know, you can typically kind of cost shift with respect to that. Um, but the big thing is, I think, you know, if you're underwriting a deal or you're looking at a deal, look at how the operator has underwritten rent increases for the immediate future. And I would also factor in where the current rents are and what the median income is for your resident base. I think that is going to um, both have an impact and you want to make sure your operator that you're uh, working with is very conservative in my opinion on those metrics. Nice. I appreciate that, Chris. And, you know, unfortunately we're running along with time, but just a few final questions already, uh, you know, what, what's, I know what, what's been the hardest part of this syndication journey or process to, for you, Chris, to get to where you're at now. I know you came from a W2 career that, you know, you obviously took a lot of work, you know, and time to get into and to be good at. Uh, but, uh, you know, now to where you're at now, what, what's been the hardest part? Yeah, I think it's, it's really, it, you know, I talk about in my book being, being an athlete, being a, uh, competitive cyclist for, for about two decades. And it's very similar. You know, you go and you may be training for an event in September, like we are now, and you start training in March. So for six months, you're just pounding away and pounding away and, you know, your, your muscles hurt and, you know, you're, you're having to eat clean. You're trying to lose weight. Um, you're making sacrifices and you, you don't see the benefit. And then you get into that race six months later and, things don't go right. You have, you know, equipment that fails or, um, you get a or somebody crashes and happens and you know, that big event that you thought was going to be your event of the year is not, and you have to, you have to change. So it's very similar. You know, we've had, we've had, I've had partnerships. I've had deals that haven't worked out. You've worked a lot of, you know, a lot of months on them, like three, six months. It doesn't happen. And you have to say, okay, um, that outcome that I had my eye set on didn't occur. And you have to take a step back and say, okay, that's all right. You're always making progress and moving forward. And what's come out of those events, you know, like, like a failed partnership, for instance, you have other relationships that come out, things that you learn from, things that make you better and ultimately uh, end up benefiting your business in the long run. So, I mean, I could list uh, a dozen different things that we've experienced over the last five or six years. Sure. Um, but I would say just the, the process of focusing on, or the, the, uh, the focus of, of being on the process versus the outcome is the most important thing that I learned. Wow. Are there anything, anything, anything else you would like to add to preparing for a downturn? I know we talked about some changes in your underwriting, but anything else as far as, you know, how you would advise someone to be prepared for another downturn or things that you do? Yeah, I think um, there's, there's two parts to that, Whitney. I think from a personal perspective and then a business perspective. So from a personal perspective, you know, I think making sure you have adequate reserves, you know, th you know six to 12 months um, in, in case something happens. If you're listening and you're concerned about your career, like that's very important. Have something. I talk about how my wife and I use infinite banking and we have information on our website under the banking link to create that storehouse of wealth and some liquidity in case we need it. And then again, if you go and you're looking at a deal, you say, well, what are the reserves like? You want to make sure that you underwrite for more conservative income, but you also want to potentially underwrite for more conservative reserves. And I think we know that lenders are also uh, taking a hard look at that. So this isn't a, this isn't a secret necessarily that I'm, that I'm revealing, but I think you can, you can apply it both in a, on your personal life as well as uh, in your business too. It's not something that most people are doing though. <laughs> for some it's reason, a, it's you know? a, it's a challenge. And, you know, if you look at the fact that, you know, you're watching the stock market, you know, it drops and then it's, it goes up 50%. You say, well, I could shove my money in the stock market and make 50%. Um, you always got to be cognizant of, you know, you look at the cash on hand of some of the wealthiest individuals and companies out there, you know, like the Buffett's, like the Amazon's, um, like uh, Medtronic that I worked for for 10 years, how much cash they have on hand. It's for a reason that they're doing that. What's a way you've recently improved your business that we could apply to our business? Yeah. So I think, um, I mentioned Caleb who has been, uh, 
basically my teammate on the marketing side for a lot of years. And I'm, I'm not a millennial. I'm a, I'm a Gen X kind of guy. I'm 42 years old. And I've had to really learn about how to use social media, for instance, how to use video and how to use different methods. Like I wrote a book. I thought that was pretty revolutionary, but then I come to find out, you know, there's this whole world of podcasting. And I think if you're, if you're growing a business right now, don't underestimate, you know, those trends that we're seeing in new generations, like the millennials, like my kids that are eight and 10, you know, you, you understand what I'm talking about Whitney. you have young children, what are they doing and how are they assimilating information? I think you should, if you have a business, look to the next generation. So we're trying to cater towards those millennials, help educate them. They may not be investors today or somebody, you know, that, that we're actively working with, but we want to make sure that we're building an audience and we're providing value uh, to those individuals. And we hope that that'll, that'll continue to help our business grow in the future, even though we may not have a direct line of sight and how that, how that's going to happen. What's your best source for meeting new investors now? Ooh, um, I mean, really, uh, I've, I've, I've networked a tremendous amount uh, with, with podcasts. Um, I think that thought leaders like yourself, you know, have podcasts. It's definitely an advantage. Um, what I've been really focused on, though, is, is locally trying to provide value you know, to investors. So I look here, you know, locally in Asheville or North Carolina, um, actually this evening we're recording a, a month or so ahead of time, but this evening I'm doing a, uh, a webinar for a student group at, um, at a college on, on real estate investing and doing that. So again, I'm, I'm kind of looking a lot of years out, but I think really if you give back and you provide value, even if there's no immediate monetary return, I really think that those things are going to, create opportunities for investors in the future. Um, and it's something that I've, I really enjoy as well. What's the number one thing that's contributed to your success? Yeah, that's an interesting, um, question. And this might not be a very popular response, but I would probably say the death of my father when I was five and my best friend, when I was 19. And the reason I say that, and there's data to back this up, it gave me a finite value of time. And what I mean by that is I think when we're young, we see time as, you know, it's, it's not as valuable because we think it's going to go on forever. But when you, when you're young and you lose somebody, you know, at a young age and you say, well, wait a minute, life could be over tomorrow or it could be over at 18 or over at 41. I think that it compressed the way my brain looked at time and it motivated me to get more done and achieve more and not leave any time on the table. And I often talk about how when I lost my friend, Chris, it, it drove me to basically live two lives, to respect the life that he didn't get to live. And that's part of the reason I quit cycling initially and get, kind of gave up my dream to become a professional cyclist. So I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I think for me personally, um, that has really given me the drive. And it took me a lot of years to kind of realize that um, I probably just realized that in the past few years about why I've been so motivated and so driven. Um, but my father died at 41 and I just passed my 41st birthday a year ago. And it was something I thought a lot about. And I truly think that that affected um, my drive for what, what we would call success. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, how, how do you like to give back? Yeah. I mentioned earlier, Whitney, um, I, you know, if, if, if you're listening and you know, you say, Hey, I, I'd like to, I'd, you know, I'd like to get where you are, where Whitney is. Um, I love to help mentor people. I love to, you know, share my story. Um, I mentioned if you, you know, if you're listening that you can get our free, our book at the book link at nextlevelincome.com and really just allowing people to realize that financial success is achievable no matter where you are or where you started. I didn't start with a lot of money. My first investment, I had less than $3,000, bought my first house, um, rental home. So if you're listening, and you say, oh, I can't even conceptualize buying a 180 unit, you know, apartment complex like Whitney did. You can start small. It's a get rich. It's a get rich slow game, but you can, ha it, you can make it happen. Chris, I'm so grateful for your time and, and the way you give back as well. And just, you know, helping us think through like what's happening right now and the trends that we're seeing and how you analyze that data, where you get it from. Very grateful for that. Uh, you're definitely Play a leader in this industry. Uh, tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you. 
Yeah, thank you, Whitney. And uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity as well. I think you do a tremendous job. Um, you're somebody I look to with the success of your podcast and try to emulate. Um, but you can check us out at nextlevelincome.com. Um, if you're interested in getting in touch with me, have any questions, anything that I can help you out with, Chris at nextlevelincome.com. And please check out a free copy of our book at the book link, put your address in and I'll send you a copy. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.